Thank you. Um, so I've got the title being Phytophthora diseases in California wildlands, landscapes and nurseries, et cetera. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of what I'll be talking about relates to our work uh, in, in natural habitats uh, and the, the connection between that and, and restoration plantings as well. Uh, but for those of you who are working in the urban sphere, there's a, there's a few things thrown out, but all of this is totally applicable to that because I just want to emphasize that although we're going to be talking about these as, as wildland and, uh, and nursery problems, these also are super, super important problems throughout urban forests and in urbanized landscapes. Um, so just uh, to get, make sure that's clear up front, let's get on with the show. Okay, um, so Phytophthora, um, the name Phytophthora is, is, is made from two words, plant and destroyer. And basically that's a pretty good description of what these are there. They're organisms that, microorganisms that destroy plants. Um, they are water molds, they're not fungi. And water molds look like fungi in many ways, and for a long time they were put together. But really it turns out once we got DNA and everything to figure these relationships out, they're really more closely related to, to brown algae and diatoms here in this group called the Strumenopiles. Phytophthora is a has the the kind of distinct uh, distinction that it's one of the most notorious plant diseases in that uh, it's been it was one of the uh, it was the cause of the the great Irish potato famine and these couple of pictures are taken from the Boston area um, it was devastating uh, effect of these this plant epiphytotic that killed essentially the main food crop of of, of the Irish and sent them either into into starvation or into migration. Um, and even though that was a uh, hundred and some odd years ago, so hundred anyway, hundred fifty plus, hundred seventy I guess. Um, this disease still causes over six billion dollars in losses annually. So it's not like uh, we really got over it. And it's not like these these diseases are essentially tractable. Um, the Phytophthora infestans happens to be an aerially dispersed Phytophthora. And it was when it was eventually described uh, in, in 1861, it was actually called Paranospora, but it was later uh, put in this new genus, the Phytophthora genus. Um, it basically causes foliar diseases, uh, leaves on, on these things also can infect the tubers, et cetera. Um, that particular pathogen has kind of relatively narrow host range, uh, and most of them are in the genus Solanum, which is where potatoes are located. There's another commonly, well, probably the other most common Phytophthora disease that people are aware of locally here, and maybe more common than the other ones, is sudden oak death, which is caused by Phytophthora morum. This is also an aerially dispersed pathogen. Um, it was introduced, it causes leaf and twig blights and stem cankers. Um, it was originally introduced by a nursery stock and planted landscapes and spread subsequently into wildlands from there. It's mostly coastal and because it's a foliar disease, it actually needs sufficient water to, to really cycle. Um, it causes, in a few hosts, it causes significant uh, mortality, and those hosts include tan oak, coast live oak, canyon live oak, black oak, uh, shrieve oak, basically oaks in the native oaks in the, in the black oak group, as well as in, in canyon live oak group. Um, some microphone noise out there somewhere, so if somebody can mute their microphone who's not muted, that would be great. Um, it can also cause some significant blighting in other species. And in 2017, which was a really wet year, there was a, a lot of Phytophthora morum activity. And we actually saw quite a bit of dieback in, in some of the Arctostaphylus species that had not been seen previously, including 
a pallida, which is uh, an endangered species. Um, in the East Bay, as well as uh, Arctostaphylus monteraensis uh, on Montera Mountain. So um, it's it's it, it has these this de dependence on on wet conditions. Um, so just a little summary thing here. Again, these are called water molds because they have a an aquatic. Uh, affinity then that that they produce these fruiting structures called sprangia and in free water they release these swimming zoospores which you see buzzing about here and these zoospores can swim in water or in water films and they're attracted to host tissue so they actively seek out what they're going to infect and that makes these very effective especially under wet conditions there's at least 150 named species uh, a lot of ones that haven't totally been named and probably many more out there. Um, for the most part, you can consider virtually all the phytophthoras that we're going to work with, talk about today as being introduced. So these are exotic organisms, uh, mostly invasives. So those zoospores, when they reach a root, this is a micrograph, electron micrograph of a root, will form these cysts and these cysts form little germ tubes that then invade the host internally. Um, this is a cross section of that. Here's the cyst on the surface, and you can see the hyphae um, working their way through the cells and, and killing the cells as it goes. So this is a kind of what we call a necrotrophic type of pathogen. It's, it kills the tissue as it goes through it and, uh, and basically lives off of that, that, that dead material. In addition to the zoosporangia and zoospores, this is a, a close-up of a zoospore. It has two flagella, uh, one of which has little, it's called a tinsel flagella because it has little, little tinsels off of it. Um, there are also um, resistant spores produced by various species. Chlamydospores are produced by some species, including Phytophthora cinnamomi, we'll be talking about quite a bit. And uh, Many species also produce oospores. This is a, these are asexual spores, the chlamydospores. The oospores are sexual spores. And that's important because every time you go through a sexual spore stage, you can have recombination, you can have selection for different types of characteristics. And that can make, can select for higher virulence or increased host range and things of that nature. So this is about the last time I'm going to show relative to sudden oak death because I'm going to mainly talk about soil borne ones, but I just want to emphasize that, again, sudden oak death, which people are familiar with, is an aerial pathogen. And really, it is an, it's, its effects on oaks are totally accidental in some respects. What it really is is a, is a leaf blighting, twig blighting disease, and the inoculum survives on these old lesions. When it's wet, it produces these sprangia and zoospores. They infect things, these foliar hosts, including California Bay, which is one of the more, more potent hosts in terms of producing inoculum. And during the wet season, that cycle can continue as long as it's wet. And so we have extended wet periods in the spring. Uh, we get a lot of disease developing. And when there's enough bay close to oaks, we end up getting these cankers formed on them from infections that occur mainly through bark cracks and other sorts of lesions on these uh, oaks, but basically we don't have spread from oak to oak. So it's kind of a dead end disease in oaks, but the oaks are the ones that are that get to have the worst impacts. So again, we've shown these things, what we see is the mortality, these bleeding cankers, if you peel them back, you can see the necrosis and the outer bark that's causing those bleeding cankers. Um, there's at least 130 known hosts in a wide number of families and genera for this particular species. So it seems like a fairly wide host range, but if we start comparing it to some of our soil-borne phytophthoras, which we're going to talk about, like Phytophthora cinnamomi, that's known to have over 3,000 hosts in 100 plus families. So it's a huge host range. And Phytophthora cactorum, which also is a root rotting pathogen, uh, well over 500 plus hosts in, in many families as well. Um, in comparison to the, to the aerial pathogens, the life cycle of these is all based in the soil. And the, and these, the Phytophthora root rot cycle, if we start with infected roots, 
Um, these can produce these resistance structures, chlamydospores and oospores, who can persist for a long time. Or they, if it's wet, they will continue to form sporangia. These structures can germinate to form sporangia. And again, they're going to release zoospores. The zoospores are going to insist, find their way to roots and insist on them. They infect those roots. And then here's a little micrograph again, sort of showing the hyphae just working its way down into that tissue. And that infect those infected roots that will then form more sporangia and will also form these resistant structures depending on the species. So the point here is that this whole cycle can occur from infection to, to sporulation and release of new spores can occur in as little as 24 hours. So that's that's pretty quick. And so under wet conditions, we can have ex very explosive cycling and quick buildup of, of uh, inoculum. So um, what we see in an urban situation, um, this, this I saw Igor was on the, on the call today and he had some years ago sent me some pictures of some uh, land of thamnus along uh, Cesar Chavez, which were all dying. That one showed up in Google uh, Street View. He sent me a sample and we baited out Phytophthora cactorum from that. He also noted there were lots of other issues with these, these urban trees in terms of how they were planted and, and the site, et cetera. But if you have, you have a Phytophthora in there, not only does it make everything worse, but you can have fairly good conditions and you can still have your plants dying. So um, the point is that anything with added with a Phytophthora that's virulent to that species is only going to make it worse. Um, here's another urban situation. This is a Quercus rober in a backyard, which has these cankers that look a lot like sudden oak death cankers, and they're reaching well up at a couple of meters up into this tree. Um, but this is from root rot associated with Phytophthora cinnamomi. And so in some of these root rotting Phytophthoras will send up vertical cankers that will cause bleeding very similar to sudden oak death. The difference is that for the sudden, for the root pathogens, you can eventually connect these these columns of of, of uh, discoloration and, and necrosis down to the to the roots. But in sudden oak death, um, all those lesions start above ground; they don't extend below ground. Um, here's a, another site with a coast live oak in decline. Um, the center picture. Yeah, you can see the bleeding very well in it. There's a little bit of bleeding here, a little bit there. Uh, we peel it back, you can see it better in this picture. There's some bleeding and there's that canker again. Again, very reminiscent of sudden oak death, but due to this other Phytophthora. So again, I want to emphasize that these Phytophthora species that are causing problems in, in California are, we're going to consider all of them to be introduced pathogens. Um, there's some speculation there may be some phytophthoras that are are native, even if there are native ones to California, they certainly weren't distributed all over the state because our climate and our our uh, the situation here is just not 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 suitable to phytophthoras having dispersed over the entire state of California across all these different habitats. So even if they were to have originated in some little pocket somewhere or strains of originated in some pocket, once they moved out of that, they're essentially an exotic anyway. But by and large, most of these originate in Asia, other areas, um, and or in many cases, we don't really know where they've originated, but they're found real worldwide. The point is that wherever they evolved, there we assume that they'd be in some kind of equilibrium with their hosts. But when they get into these naive hosts, these hosts that have never been exposed to these pathogens, we have all kinds of destruction that can occur. Um, these are madrones in Marin County affected by Phytophthora cinnamomi. Um, a lot of this work was started with uh, our work on Arctostaphylos myrtifolia, the island manzanita. It's a federally threatened species. It occurs in the foothills of Sierra Nevada, very dry area. And this is what it looks like where you have Phytophthora cinnamomi uh, introduced, it totally wipes out this species and it uh, essentially just works its way through these stands 
and they're non-recoverable over time. They basically, this is essentially sending this species into ex extinction because it's wiping out the, the habitat that would otherwise occupy. We do see some effects on other species, but not, not at the same d degree. So here's Berberitifolia, which is a scrub oak, and you can see it looks really shabby here, um, but not dying right away. Here's a interior live oak seedling that's been killed right amongst all this, this dead um, Arctostaphylos, and here's a, a larger one that is that is going out as well. But we do see oaks surviving in, in this area for, for an extended period. So they're not quite as susceptible as the manzanitas. After that fire, which was really the first widespread wildland infestation of Cinnamomy that was documented, uh, we subsequently found in the Oakland Hills that there was also um, Phytophthora cinnamomi killing both Arctostaphylos, uh, Paladin, and other endangered species, as well as giant chinkapin, madrones, and other species. Um, this site here uh, was, this is it in 2006. This is what it looks like in 2007. All that plant material is dead, and nothing's really come back. Um, I, this actually has a little bit of a video that pans around, but I want to really take time to show it, but you can kind of get the idea of the, the habitat here. And as it worked its way, as we'll talk about, down from these residential areas, downslope into these areas where mainly we're, we're seeing Arctostaphylos, but also a lot of chinkapin um, that's in this area is, is being killed. Um, so it just shows mortality of uh, of uh, Madrone and Chinkapin. Um, other areas, Marin County, where we have, was known for sudden oak death. Uh, we also started seeing that sudden oak death was killing the, the oaks, but the bays, which should be happy because the oaks weren't there competing with them, were dying too. And in fact, Phytophthora cinnamomi had been introduced to this area and was killing those. So it's total wipeout of that, that whole ecosystem in that area. And we found Phytophthora cinnamomi and other Phytophthora on the uh, Pew C watershed uh, in San Mateo County. Um, again, mainly affecting Monroe and Bay, but other species as well. Watersheds seem to be good ways to attract Phytophthora. Um, this is the MMWD watershed. This is Madrone showing the rate of decline over a couple of years. And this is an affected stand, which would have been a closed canopy forest at one point, and it's now going out. So symptom-wise, what are we seeing here? We're seeing mortality, we're seeing decline, we see reduced growth, um, we see uh, dieback. Um, one of the symptoms typical of, of Phytophthora is also wilt, but more, mainly that only shows up in small plants and and most of these kind of woodier plants like uh, we have here, like bay and whatnot, don't really wilt, they just eventually just turn brown. But um, basically a wide event of sort of effects which are all associated with water stress because what's happening is the roots are being decayed, they're no longer taking up water, and once they can't do that, we end up uh, burning the top off. Um, so again, just to show you some some different effects in different places, uh, this is Marin County. Also, again, giant chinkapin. Here's some sublethal effects on the understory. This is most, mostly huckleberry. And again, you see it looks really shabby. A lot of dieback, but it isn't quite dead. This is another Phytophthora species. This is out in the peninsula uh, where we see it causing decline in oaks and killing toyons. Uh, again, these kind of thin canopies and the trees can hang on for an extended period sometimes, uh, but they're never really going to amount to much. And under right conditions, they'll be flat out killed. And again, on this one, there were some basal cankers. So this isn't even complete anymore, but uh, because we can't keep track of all the places, uh, I make a lot of maps to show all the places we've got phytophthora. But it just shows you that these phytophthora are widely spread um, inland as well as in coastal areas. They can be in wetter areas and drier areas. Uh, we found a lot of cinnamomy in Cambivora, but there's a lot of other species lurking out there as well. And they're causing more ta significant mortality of uh, native plants in these areas. So how are these Phytophthora getting introduced and spread around? 
So here's an example. This is back to the Oakland Hills and the uh, Arctis Dathlis Pallida area. And Phytophthora tends to invade these communities by being introduced from some source. In this case, and we'll talk about it more later on, uh, probably nursery stock um, in these urban plantings here, infested with Phytophthora, um, because they produce these flow, these these spores that can be dispersed in water. We have a tendency that when you have an introduction, you have greater movement downhill but you can also have root to root type spread across the slope as well. And then beyond this area that might be infested just by natural spread, you get secondary spread to other locations by people moving soil or animals or other sorts of things that can move significant amounts of soil or, or root debris. How fast do these things spread? This is Ion Manzanita. Um, here's a, here's a, oh, a little transect that was made up 2004, 2014. You can see the zero point back here. We're back out to the five meter zone. And we usually see a, on in this system about a meter per year on the level or uphill. That's kind of root to root spread. Uh, so it's working against the gravity flow that would move those spores downhill. So it still occurs in those directions. Um, 2016, you can see it's spanned well past the five meter mark and it's almost to the horizon here. Once it crosses over, it's now in another watershed. And one of the issues with Phytophthora is it can move quickly downhill with flowing water. So on this site, you can see how far it moved in just a couple of years. And it's, you know, it's a total wipeout everywhere downslope from these areas. Um, these Phytophthora spores can can be spread even just in in temporary runoff water. Um, we had Phytophthora cambivora detected in, in by water from this just little intermittent stream runoff, um, as well as uh, Phytophthora cryptogea complex, and that was probably associated with some plantings that were done just just a few hundred meters, well actually a few dozen meters up this direction. But we can also find Phytophthora in other types of surface waters. Um, we can detect that just basically by skimming the surface. We'll use a, put it into a, a container with a bait and green pears are pretty favorite bait. They make a nice lesion with many different Phytophthora species and uh, that can be, you can directly isolate that. So surface waters are always have to be considered a risky situation for, for Phytophthora. Because the inoculum can persist through some of these spore forms, um, we have, in, for instance, in the island Manzanita, you think, well, why doesn't th things regenerate after a while? Doesn't the Phytophthora go away? Well, it doesn't. And you can see all these little brown things are seedlings that germinated and then were killed by the resistant, by the residual inoculum in the soil. Sometimes these plants live for a few years, oops. Um, but, they eventually get in contact with that inoculum. These are so susceptible that they're killed pretty quickly once they become infected. So again, spread of these pathogens can be made by moving soil. And one way in this, in the island manzanita habitat, there's a lot of off-road vehicle use in some of these areas. And this whole area, these areas where all this OHV activity that's been going on is just widely, widely infested. Almost all the benzene in here is dead. We are at some other site in the Myakimus Mountains where we found some Phytophthora hits in various spots. And in this particular site seemed to be associated with a, some trenching activity. Anytime you're working with equipment that can move soil, there's a lot of uh, inadvertent movement that can also occur on that. And those that can be a large amount of soil and you can move contamination easily from one spot to another if the equipment isn't clean to begin with. In the case of this site, which was the Hukuiku Trail in Marin County on the Mount Tam watershed, um, the mortality center is actually centered around this trail. So probably some kind of trail maintenance activity, possibly with dirty tools or people with uh, contamination on their shoes or whatever, introduced it to this spot and then it subsequently moved both uphill and downhill from there. In China Camp State Park, we have this, this well-known area here and another spot we found up there 
there had been some um, activity to remove eucalyptus way up on the top of this mountain and potentially the, the equipment that we went up there, some of that was infested and basically ended up contaminating this area. Okay, so we know how it can be moved around in various ways, but where is it actually coming from to begin with? I mean, they just don't drop in off the sky, so they had to get here somewhere if they're exotic. And really, the primary source of these things are infected nursery stock. Um, and we've known this for a long time. At least plant pathologists have known it for a long time. We can go back to 1945 and before, but we can see reports through the literature over the decades talking about the amount of phytophthora in nurseries. And there was this paper, this European paper with 61 co-authors in 2015, which uh, concluded that nursery stands across Europe were almost ubiquitously infested by many, many phytophthora species. And that's essentially the exact situation we have here in the US and much of the rest of the world as well. Um, and we just run it forward from, from 2014, where we'll be talking about as a sort of a starting date. Additional research done locally, especially on the native plants, um, certainly confirms that, that we've got plenty of phytophthora contamination in these nursery stock. Um, and the problem with that is not only just some phytophthora species, there's a lot of phytophthora out there that have different host ranges, different virulence levels. And um, the bottom line is that more and more of them are being introduced all the time uh, by the nursery trade. And in terms of ornamental nurseries versus native plant nurseries, there's never really been any kind of firewall between those. So anything that shows up in one nursery type can show up in the other type. And that's where the problem really came in from these native plant nurseries. So why is Phytophthora a common in nurseries? Uh, what is it about nurseries um, that that makes them so so such sources of phytophthora? Well, this goes back to a little basic um, concept of of uh, plant pathology known as the plant disease triangle. And plant diseases are a particular interaction between a susceptible host, a virulent pathogen, and a conducive environment. Um, so you don't you need all of these components to be in alignment to have diseases occur. And the environment really, especially when we're talking about root diseases, we have to consider both the abiotic environment, temperature, moisture, et cetera, and the biotic environment, other sorts of organisms in there that might compete with, with pathogens in the soil. But then these all interact with each other in various ways. And when the right combination of them occurs that, such that pathogen is favored and you end up with a situation where disease can occur, but it also occurs through the dimension of time. So these situations have to exist in a way that is favorable for disease for an extended period of time, not instantaneously for things to happen. So if we look at a nursery, our nursery situation and with Phytophthora, in terms of the abiotic environment, we've got all the moisture and saturation and kind of moderate temperatures that are all very favorable for Phytophthora. Our host factors are also very favorable. We have high host densities. Everything's packed in tight as a drum. Uh, there's a lot of root density in these containers. There's a lot of times predisposing stresses. And in terms of antagonism or anything, these are very simple systems and they're never really going to have high levels of effective antagonists. And again, antagonism is is only is kind of a dicey way to, to fight phytophthora anyway. There's they're not that can suppress them, but it's never going to eliminate them. But the bottom line, and then the longer we keep material in the nursery, the more problems we more chances we have for everything to to, to lock into alignment. But the bottom line is plant nurseries provide just about the optimal conditions for developing phytophthora diseases. If you wanted to figure out a way to grow phytophthora, you would basically come up with a, a plant nursery. I and mean, that would exactly be what you came up with because all the conditions are perfect for it. So we think of nurseries as these kind of clean and green, nice little areas, but epidemiologically, this is what a nursery is. It's basically, a bunch of susceptible plants all packed together and 
just waiting for a pathogen. If you and as we know from bird flu and things like that, this is this would be a disaster area, and that's essentially what we have here. Okay, so we talked about symptoms a little bit. Again, we talked about wilt. You can sometimes have off color. Um, you can have stunting, all the sorts of things that you might expect if your roots were just a little bit iffy. So here's three toyons that we pulled out of this nursery's block. And you know, this one makes a little off color maybe, um, and there's different sizes. So maybe some are stunted and some are not. Well, if you look at the roots of these, they're all, they all have totally rotten roots. This one, the roots have got shot, so are this one. The middle one has a few live roots there. You knock out the root ball. You can see there's there's almost no live roots. There's just a few things going on there. And part of the problem we have with, especially if we're using fairly drought tolerant species, which we like to use, and many California natives are drought tolerant, we can have a lot of root rot. But if they're growing in a nursery condition or watered frequently, you just do not see the top symptoms. So what happens is that those plants, things like these junipers, which are always loaded with Phytophthora, get planted out um, in a situation like this, and then the Phytophthora moves out into the surrounding vegetation. As we see the bays and madrones here, this is the Phytophthora cinnamomy infested location. Going back to that hilltop in the East Bay we were talking about, where we see these chinkapins and the manzanitas were dying, um, all these hits for Phytophthora, the red dots, all down below this this residential area, and again, it appears very likely that's where where the introduction was, just from from material flowing downhill from those those areas. In this particular spot in the uh, peninsula watershed, we have a lot of hits of Phytophthora in this particular area, shown here with these multiple hits. Well, what we have is the Fololi estate here, a landscaped estate with it has its own nursery. It has a caretaker's house over here. They commute right along this, this corridor here, and they have plenty of Phytophthora in both their nursery stock and in that estate as well from the nursery stock that was previously planted there. So um, that just from some incidental travel back before that, it seems to have spread to, to that whole area with these sorts of results. So um, so we were quite well aware with things were going on with the, in these watersheds with Phytophthora. We knew Phytophthora was a potentially being brought in with nursery stock and we were working with PUC um, people and they brought us in a, to ask us some questions about relative to their BHR program, big restoration project associated with the Hetch Hetchy upgrades. And there was gonna be a lot of planting going on there and they were wondering about sudden oak death, but we sort of wanted them to change their focus to what about root rotting phytophthoras. And they looked at some of their nurseries that were nominally adhering to BMPs for producing sod free plants. But these nurseries were kind of not really in compliance with things that would prevent root rotting phytophthoras. Um, one of the things we don't want is plants on the ground because it's really easy. That's a very good reservoir for disease. So it doesn't really make much difference if they start on the ground and then you move them a little bit above the ground. If they've been on the ground, they're already contaminated. There was various things that were done to try to get these nurseries into alignment with, with good standards. And like this old song lyric, it's nice to get advice, but it's a lot harder to do in some cases, especially when people just were not really aware of these pathogens in a lot of these nurseries. And so sketchy things like putting your soil, your potting soil on the ground, um, you know, having your waste, throwing away your plants right next to the, your new potting soil, um, not necessarily a good idea. In 2014, we got some this seedling from from some of the outplantings that have been done for the BHR project, and we found both Phytophthora cactorum and this other species, Phytophthora tentaculata. Well, Phytophthora tentaculata had only once ever been detected in the US before, uh, a few years earlier, on native plant material from another place that was supposedly eradicated. Um, Phytophthora tentaculata was also on a 
top five list of species that uh, were not were hope the USDA wanted to keep out of the U.S. because they felt it could have significant impacts to <clears throat> agriculture and native systems. So that drove a lot of additional testing. And as we started testing most of the plants for that material, we were already in the field. We did find some hits on some of the material that hadn't been planted, such as that uh, oak there and these uh, carex here, where we find a phytophthora. Um, and both for that project and other ones for Santa Clara, Vera, Santa Clara Valley Water District, we started sampling a number of, of existing plantings. And as we went out there and sampled these plants, we were finding all kinds of Phytophthora species. Um, in the case of this one, which is just locally down the street from where I was, <clears throat> here we have two different plants from the same planting species um, sampled. We have three total Phytophthora species just from two plants. Um, and we had these plants being planted out into habitat sites and finding Phytophthora on those species. Uh, this was a particularly nasty situation where uh, we have a, a assisted migration situation here where they're trying to colonize new habitat with this endangered Phytophthora species, but virtually everything they planted was, was infested with Phytophthora cactorum, and most of that material was dying. And this isn't just a Northern California phenomenon. Uh, we've done some work with it down in Angeles National Forest, and that's a quite drier place. And even though Phytophthora likes wet conditions, um, we're finding it in the nursery stock, and we're finding it in the outplanted nursery stock. This species called Mediterranea actually was unnamed when we found it. Um, it was subsequently found somewhere in, I think, Italy. And they put, applied the name Mediterranea on it. Of course, uh, it could just as well have been called um, Phytophthora of Southern Californiensis because that's where it was first found. But um, the point is, there's even in these dry habitats, we're coming across survival of Phytophthora and it's killing these plants that are being put in there. Um, these are all these Angeles National Forest sites. And you can see, the material that's being killed back and forth. And the problem is that a lot of times this, the same species are being planted next to native stands of, of the same species. Um, again, this is a, a situation where here's some native live coast live oaks. And just in three seedlings sampled close to these, we had four different species, including this one taxon <clears throat> agrifolia. We're calling it that's another unnamed Undescribed, previously undescribed species. Um, with uh, Santa Clara Valley Water District, after some of our work, uh, contracted with uh, the UC Davis Rizzo Lab to sample a lot of their previous plantings that they've done recently. They came up with this kind of appalling list of 38 species of Phytophthora on 28 plant species. They also had two undescribed species of Phytophthora in there. And this species, Phytophthora corsina, um, also known to be an, a significant oak pathogen in Europe, never before found in the U.S. definitively. Um, it was not only here, but it had obviously been here for a while on these transplanted uh, Quercus lobatas. And again, if we go to these older plantings, we can see Phytophthora species on plantings that have persisted for a while and then eventually flare out. And as, as you do more sampling of these systems, you come up with lots of lots of Phytophthora taxa being spread around these nursery plants, just in oaks, California native oaks. This is some of our sampling. And you can see all these that came directly off of nursery origin plants. And there's at least 29 taxa of Phytophthora, certainly more than that. So we know that the conventional nursery stock used for habitat restoration poses a real high risk of Phytophthora introduction. We have this wide diversity. We've got all kinds of new species we've never seen before. Um, many different plant species it can be in wet and dry locations, northern and southern California. And when we introduce via nursery stock, we can greatly increase the amount of pathogen we can bring into a site because many of these species have of the plant species have multiple Phytophthora species in the nursery. 
So you might wander from one area to another and bring one Phytophthora species, but when you bring in thousands of nursery plants that are infected, you can bring in dozens and dozens of Phytophthora species. It's a terrible situation. And again, I just want to emphasize that a lot of these studies are based on stock cues for restoration, but exactly the same, if not worse, is going on in our horticultural nurseries and landscape. And we also know that Phytophthora has spread from these restoration plants into the adjoining vegetation. Um, this is on site in San Mateo County. We detected all this Phytophthora in this area, as well as some stuff close to these lake shores areas. Well, the introduction in this area seems to be associated with nursery grown uh, plants that were planted for mitigation, restoration purposes. Um, over 65% of the samples in this area were positive, whereas we're going to these upland areas away from this planting, we didn't have any detections. We did have this detection here or right along a trail, probably spread by people moving it on shoes and whatnot. There are also some right along this lake shore that was associated with, there's a residential development down this way. And during a high flood event, um, that's right where all the urban runoff with all the phytophthoras and debris and stuff. Um, I think we had a kind of a ring type effect where we had some inoculation going on there. This is back in Southern California. This, uh, we have these nursery plants that are infected and dying with phytophthoras here. And this melasma down the slope um, within six years was dying from the phytophthora that we've detected up in these plants up here. And in this case here, uh, this Arctostaphylos hookeri, ravenei, um, <clears throat> this is the last original clone of this species it's in San Francisco. And to kind of try to expand it, they planted some nursery stock of, grown from this material around it. Unfortunately, that stock was was apparently infested with Phytophthora when it was grown in the nursery. So um, now that clone is in really sad shape. And um, that whole area is kind of threatened because they moved this contamination into it. Um, at this particular site, also in San Francisco, uh, we are asked to do some sampling. We'll talk about it a little bit later because they were going to thinking about using the soil from this area for other for other uses for restoration. And we did see some funky looking plants here and there. We it seemed like a kind of a wasty area. We really didn't expect to find much, but we did pick up phytophthoras associated with woody vegetation. There's a couple of spots here. You don't see the woody vegetation there, but they'd already moved some of those trees out. Well, what makes this area so susceptible to being contaminated? Well, it turns out that it was historically a city-run nursery site, um, mid-century up, up through um, mid-century. This is a 38 aerial photo showing the, the nursery grounds and housing and other things associated with that. So just showing that these things can persist for a long time once they've been introduced. So what are we going to do? Um, well, the answer really is to produce and use phytophthora free nursery stock. Um, and this little headline sort of summarizes it. I mean, the answer's out there. We just don't want to plant material that's infected. Whoops. And we do that by starting clean, getting, making sure that the material you're growing is all clean inputs and you keep it clean in the way that you're growing it. And that is not what has been done so far in nurseries. However, it can be done, and we published on this recently and developed a accreditation program to produce phytophthora free stock. Um, this is available online. And this is a program we would call the Accreditation to Improve Restoration or AIR program. The goal of this is to protect our native vegetation and habitats by ensuring that native habitats aren't, aren't infested through the process of restoration of moving in nursery stock because this is not what restoration looks like. You can't restore something obviously by default if you introduce an agent that is essentially going to kill the, both the existing vegetation as well as the, the plant, the restoration plants that are put in there. So it's a pretty straightforward thing. Don't use phytophthora infested nursery stock. Um, 
So there are BMPs that are effective and there are BMPs that are not effective. The ones that we're trying to talk about here were produced uh, in collaboration with the Phytophthora Working Group or the Working Group for Phytophthora's in Native Habitats, calphytophthora.org. Um, we also have CNPS cited here because we originally started working on these uh, BMPs for CNPS and previous to that, we're working on them for Santa Clara Valley Water District. So they're kind of a, a big mashup that, of the best practices and they're kind of consolidated. Uh, we have it up on our website um, and it's also on some of these other sites and I happen to like the way we put it there. It's just a little bit cleaner, easier to navigate through, but uh, they're all essentially the same practices. These are not practices that other nurseries follow. I'm not hearing Ted anymore. Ted, you accidentally muted yourself. Sorry. That must have been a wild click. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, I can hear you now. Great. Uh, okay. <laughs> My control panel, I must have just flailed at it. Um, uh, so anyway, I guess the point we were, I was on this slide, I was saying, start clean, keep it clean. These are your clean inputs, all the things that goes into growing nursery plants. And these are various ways you keep things clean by making sure that you don't contaminate it by various other ways. Um, and the bottom line is none of this is really overly novel. Um, this, this UC method for producing healthy container rodent plants, this book was written the year before I was born. Um, and it basically is talking about exactly the same thing. So it's not like there's been a lack of knowledge, there's been a lack of, of implementation. Um, so let's talk about these phytophthora free nurseries and compliant nurseries. So how much can phytophthora can we have in these nurseries? Well, the answer is none because you really have to have no phytophthora in the nursery, otherwise you end up with a lot of phytophthora in the nursery. And what we mean by that is that we know that phytophthora grows well in nurseries, but also spreads very, very readily. And container nurseries are very tightly packed. Here's a little experiment where we inoculated one plant in this little set of 25, let them go for 110 days. You can see there, some of these have died in the meantime, other ones haven't, but we actually bait them out. All but three of these baits in this one corner, which would be the front edge of the bench, um, were infected. And two of these that were, we didn't get the phytophthora out of, the plants were long dead, so it's quite possible they were killed and we just didn't detect the inoculum. So maybe only one plant in this whole 25 wasn't infected. The other thing to note is that most of these plants that are infected don't really show the obvious shoot, shoot symptoms, which I talked about before. You can have a lot of root rot without seeing it. And so that gets us to this whole concept about using scouting. Scouting is a big IPM practice and everybody knows about that. But can we use that to detect and eliminate Phytophthora infected plants? The answer is no. It's both too little and too late. You can detect too little of this stuff because many of the plants that are infected you'll never see. And if you've seen them being dead already, um, it's already spread well beyond that. This whole set of material, we did, th did three tests on this, um, of which I'll talk about later, all of those were positive. So um, and by scouting, you're not gonna say, oh yeah, some of this is infected, some of this isn't, all this is infected. It's just not gonna happen. Um, here's an example. We were doing some pathogenicity tests on these Ceanothus seedlings. We inoculated the ones, these are before inoculation, the 115 days after inoculation, these are the ones that were inoculated, these were not. See, both of them have grown, these have grown further than those, but we consistently detected Phytophthora by baiting from these during that whole period. And at the end, we can see that, that the bottoms of these root systems where it's the dampest and the inoculum winds are gone um, or decayed, and we had a fair amount of root decay in these things. If they were grown outside, these plants on this side would likely be dead by now. But 
if we keep them growing for a longer time, and we've seen a lot of the outplanting stuff we've shown, plants are still alive after years, that means that they can continue to produce inoculum that can be spread out into the environment. So actually the fact that they aren't killed is actually in some ways worse than they were dead right away. If they were dead in the nursery, you wouldn't plant them. But if you get just a plant, bunch of plants that look a little funky in the nursery, well, if they, if people start going to horticultural reasons. Well, they don't like the, they're going dormant or maybe they don't like the potting mix or they don't like the light or they got too much water, or not enough water, or they could all be affected with phytophthora, which was the case in, in this batch. You just can't tell by looking. So you've got to really exclude phytophthora from these nurseries because you're not going to be able to pick it out. So we don't want less phytophthora, we want no phytophthora. Um, and so this clean production process is the key to excluding phytophthora. And you need to have testing in the process to help check that your implementation is going on and also to be there as a fail safe in case you get some kind of accidental contamination. So what do we do about testing for phytophthora? Um, there's limitations on all test methods. One of the biggest problems are false negative results, and everybody knows about COVID testing and whatnot, so they know about something about false negatives and false positives. But the bottom line is false negatives are really easy to come by. There's lots of ways to get false negatives. You don't have enough inoculum in the sample, or the sample's too small, or you happen to miss the ones that were infected, even though they're right next to other ones that weren't infected, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the bottom line is, there's a lot of ways to end up with, with, with a false negative. So a single negative test is never a definitive thing. And this has been a this is a rookie mistake, as it's called. But let's say people run a test and they say, oh, okay, these plants, that test was negative, these plants are clean. It's just you just can't do that due to the reliability of these tests. On the other hand, a positive test in most cases, um, is much more meaningful because you can't usually detect things if it's not there. Um, there are a couple of detection methods that can produce false positives, but anything that involves baiting or culturing, there are no false positives because you can't actually recover the organism if it isn't there to begin with. So um, false positives are things like ELISA strips or antibody type tests. Those can pr produce false positive, but if we're talking about baiting, culturing methods, no, you're not going to run into that. Um, other kinds of general limitations, cost and effort. You've got thousands and thousands of plants. Um, how do you sample enough to make it worthwhile? Um, and then we, some pesticides can suppress oomycetes and they can, they can interfere with the tests. And I want to take a little side jaunt on this because people say, well, why don't we just use fungicides and kill the phytophthora? Well, the bottom line is, all these things that are called fungicides, which isn't really right because they aren't fungi anyway, and they aren't sides either because they don't actually kill the pathogen. All they do is, is suppress symptoms and slow disease progress at best when they're working properly. There have been effective phytophthora fungicides in use in nurseries since the 1970s, very highly effective materials. And we just look at a, a few studies here and you can see, okay, all these nurseries are using fungicides left and right. And what are we getting? Tons and tons of phytophthora species. They're not making these things go away. They're not keeping them from spreading. And one of the reasons is that we, we apply fungicides or toxicants of various sorts. We have a kind of a dose response type thing. Um, until you get to really high levels, you're not getting complete suppression and maybe not even killing it there, just keeping it from growing out. And the bottom line is at these less effective levels, that's where most of the, the doses are because you can't, because of residues and other sorts of things, you can't really apply these super high levels anyway. So you're always applying at a level as that you know is not gonna be 100% effective. So the bottom line is if you've got nursery stock that's infected, you add fungicides, you still have infected nursery stock. It does not go away. And we had some situation where we were testing some material clearly root rot, I would just with, did some baiting, but we weren't able to pick it out. But we know these people were using this fungicide, which could interfere with our test. So what are, kind of tests are we talking about? Um, there are various ways to test. We ended up coming up with a method to support the AIR program. 
to be able to test batches of plants. It's a non-destructive test. It can it can test individual plants or bunches of them. Um, there's no false positives because it is a detection test. Each detection is epidemiologically meaningful, which means that if we actually find it, we've actually got infective material coming out of those plants. So we know that it's not just not just like stray DNA that might have been from a killed spore or something. We know that there's active infection going on there. But it can still be done by nurseries with simple equipment, and it works for a wide range of container sizes. You can see these number 15 containers here. Uh, they end up getting irrigated to eight liters um, per irrigation, whereas these little dinky ones over here, these SC7s, only end up getting 20 mils. Um, and you can test as little as a single container. The difference between this test and this test here is 2400x. So huge difference in volume, this test still works. Um, and what it really we're doing here is we're watering these plants through a specific schedule multiple times. We're washing zoospores and other spores into this specialized vessel down here. Zoospores swim upward. That's the thing they do. It's called negative geotaxis. They swim in opposing the force of gravity. They always want to swim to the surface. Um, and so they swim upward in the vessel. The vessel's got a kind of a narrow water area here, and we've got a floating bait there, and that's something the zoospores like, so they end up glomming onto that. What about all the extra water that's going to be generated? Well, we drain it off the bottom, so we aren't washing all our floating zoospores off the top. We're draining it from the bottom of the container. And so what a test look like, or something like this, we have an array of plants that are set to be tested. We irrigate them, the water is caught by this thing, sends it down to this vessel. We eventually transfer after the test that into a, a holding container for a few days, and we can develop phytophthora lesions within a week or so from the test. Now, we've applied this test in a lot of different places, um, and this is just to kind of show you how what the difference is between nurseries that are following the, the the air or the phytophthora working group BMPs and those that aren't. So generally non-compliant nurseries follow very few of these nursery phytophthora BMPs. And these are just kind of practices. If you grow the plants in the ground, you can't prevent contamination from the soil. Um, here's a soil bin that not only is on the ground and at grade, but they decided to pitch the old the old killed plant root systems into that, it's inoculating the stuff before it's even planted. And here's a situation where, again, we have clean material, what should be clean materials and dirty materials and everything all jumbled around. Very hard to cro prevent cross contamination. Just a few tests here. Um, the only in these 24 tests in these different nurseries in these different years, you can see our percent positive test rate is pretty high here overall. And in most of these places, but even with these small number of tests, we were detecting multiple phytophthoras. Well, what about partially compliant? This is kind of where a lot of nurseries that are following so-called BMPs improve growing practices, but not really the nursery phytophthora ones that are known to be effective. Well, we do generally see lower rates of, of infestation. We still see lots of phytophthora species depending and the bottom line is we just have to test a little bit more. So in this nursery, K, uh, we did a few tests at one point, ended up with nothing, went back and tested a, a lot more, and we had a higher inf infection rate, but some of these materials that we were testing weren't really high risk. They were grasses and ferns that aren't really phytophthora hosts. And so the infection rate was even higher among the more typical hosts. But you can see there's a range of of infection levels here. And these are sometimes just nurseries that were making maybe one mistake uh, instead of having the full BMPs. So again, a little improvement over this, but in the end, you're still planting out infected plants. And again, you have to do enough testing to be sure that you've got a valid test. Okay, what about if they're following these full compliance of the, the CNPS, Phytophthora Working Group Air Program, BMPs, We've done 24,000 plus containers, 677 tests. 
have no positives at all on any of these tests in multiple years for some of these nurseries where they've been compliant over years. Again, oops, you can compare that to these other ones. And you can see there's a big difference between zero and even 20% of tests. And again, we're not talking over, that's over a certain average of things um, could have as high as 50 plus percent in some of these nurseries. So um, these, these BMPs work. The bottom line is we've got a validated sensitive test method and we show that if you really follow these BMPs well, um, you're gonna end up uh, excluding Phytophthora. And so, Again, it's based off of these science-based BMPs, the nursery evaluations, and use of the testing for quality control. What about a non-compliant test? Can we just go in there and test it and find, pick out the good ones? No, the bottom line is there's limitations on the testing, so you just can't go in there and you need basically clean nursery practices if you want to produce clean stock. Uh, you can, the testing will definitely document that you've got infection in these, these non-compliant situations but it won't allow you to pick out clean out of dirty. Okay, so again, preventing in the introductions, we don't wanna bring in infested material like this nursery stock planted in this wildland area that was planted way up here, um, where we have native stands of oaks. And it's just not a good idea to be putting your infected material at the top of the watershed amongst sensitive resources. So, you can either use clean material or you could, and nursery stock where you can also do things like direct seeding. Here's oaks that were direct seeded 15, 14 years before. The seed really have no real risk of phytophthora contamination. They're correct, collected cleanly and um, you can grow plants very quickly in those situations. You don't want to bring in infested material. Um, so you want to do use your risk analysis, testing and treatment to avoid bringing in materials. So in this situation, again, they were looking to potentially use the soil elsewhere and the testing found that the soil was contaminated. So it made sense not to use it elsewhere. Um, if we have soil that's already stockpiled or in stockpiles, it's much, testing is much more problematic because you really are mainly trying to test roots. And when you got stockpiles, you don't know where the roots are, you don't know where the contamination is, you don't know how it was, how the soil pile is inverted, and the number of samples you need to do to actually detect something definitively is prohibitive. Um, you can also use clean or low risk materials. I saw Mia was in on this thing, and I hope she doesn't mind me just showing a couple of pictures. She was trying to source some cleaned mulch, and we were looking at different alternatives. Eventually came up with the idea with this log pile. If we took the logs that were the cleanest off that, debarked them to get any kind of potential soil contamination off them, and then power wash, hot water cleaned them to get any other contamination. You could then, under a clean process, chip them, and you would have as clean material as you could come up with. I mean, there's no phytophthora inside the middle of these logs, so that's not really a source. You also want to not spread things around uh, in the process of doing virtually anything. We can move Phytophthora along. We actually scraped off these boots and baited Phytophthora and Crassomera on them. If you're working in wet conditions, it's really easy to move contamination. But this was just taken earlier this week um, at a site where we're under dry conditions. And you can see this equipment is carries tons and tons of soil with it. So if you're moving between areas that could be contaminated or not, that's problematic. So that's really one of the key to managing these existing. If we know we have a Phytophthora infestation somewhere, we need to kind of know where it is so that we can figure out our management because we never really want to be moving from the infested area into the, to the non-infested areas if we have an infestation. We always want to go the other direction. If you're going from clean to dirty and then it disinfests before you go out, you're not going to move contamination. But if you go from dirty into clean without disinfesting, you're going to have spread, be spreading contamination. See, I'm running pretty long, so I'm just going to speed through a couple of these things. How common are Phytophthora infestations in places? I mean, are we at, what do we have to look out for? This is a study in Santa Clara County where we do a bunch of open space park type sites, part of their um, uh, reserve system. And basically, we had a lot of positives in places, but we were sampling in places we thought 
were at risk for phytophthora. And we end up with 20 different phytophthora taxa. Um, some of them detected just in water, or some detected in water, some in very dry upland sites, and other sites like this one here that might have periodic flooding or along waterways and stuff tended to have more hits in those areas. At this site here, we picked up this Phytophthora down at this site here. We thought we'd sample upstream to see where it might have come from. Uh, it was causing uh, dieback in these bays. And we had hits of all kinds of other Phytophthora, but we didn't actually find that one upstream. So it kind of tells you there's more diversity there than you might think. This is a site here, down this watershed where there's landscaping and restoration planning. This is a former orchard, all potential sources of some of these contaminations. Um, this is happening in the same park. They're grazing it and not too far from where we know this contaminated area. So you have to think about if you have a contaminated area, what sorts of practices could move contamination and timing and restricting certain types of things at different times of year. At the, we also want to avoid creating routes that allow movement. And this site here of endangered species habitat, there's no Phytophthora here, there's Phytophthora here, but there's a big engineering project going on now here where they're going to replace this whole spillway or rework it. Um, so a big part of, the, of what's going on there is trying to avoid cross-contaminating. What if we have planting sites? Can we eradicate existing introductions? Um, it can be done under the right conditions. Um, not necessarily easy. This was the site in Santa Clara County where we had infested did uh, the assisted mitigation site with all these uh, plantings with a peacactorum in them. Um, they did a double level layer of, of greenhouse film plastic to um, solarize these sites. And these had a, this high solar radiation site. Um, and then we were able to sample later on to check to see whether or not we actually killed the pathogen in these sites. We had instrumentation to measure the temperatures here. And one thing you can see is you can get a lot higher temperatures close to the surface than even just a little bit below the surface. At 20 centimeters, our temperature ranges are just not getting as high. But a critical threshold is 35 C. You've got to get above that for some amount of time to really do anything. And that 35 C was exceeded at 20 20 centimeters depth for most sites for a certain amount of time. but uh, at one, this particular site, which was more shady, we didn't have that going on, and we had more detections there. Uh, we used some light meters to kind of quantify the light levels, and we could actually find out what light levels were associated with effective solarization. So then we actually cleaned these remaining sites up by having them excavate these sites and put them into solar ovens. Now, a solar oven gets a lot hotter um, than a, than a solarization in the soil because you've isolated the system. And here's some temperature graphs of the soil inside of these solar ovens. And you can see uh, 35 degrees down here, 50 degrees up here. We're exceeding that for hours every day and getting up to a 70 degree, which is 158 Fahrenheit and above. So we're able to, they're able to dig up these sites, leave them in the oven for a few days so we had sufficient heat treatment and then return them to the site. Okay, our last resort is gets down to chemicals. Um, this is Island Manzanita site. There's really no tractable thing we can do here. We did test the use of phosphites here and you can see how effective it is where we had these two sites look the same when we started. Um, the phosphite tree one remained still alive, whereas the not shut tree stuff died. Phosphites are fully systemic. They can move from the leaves down into the roots, and that's very helpful because it's very hard to apply enough stuff to the soil. It can be phytotoxic. You see some brown tips on some of these things. You have to test the, the phytotoxicity level. And this little side thing, Phytophthora, uh, phosphite's been used against Phytophthora remorum by injection but we did find that the original injection rates that were being prescribed were phytotoxic. They're actually killing the, the tissue inside of the plants where they were being injected. Anyway, we use material, very kind of specialized equipment to try to 
you can't go marching through these endangered species and keep a constant rate or whatever. So uh, we've used this overhead kind of boom thing that pulls along and this giant piece of, of, of hardware here to bring it in on the bicycle. Um, and as cool as that might look, we've got even a nicer system for putting on low volume thing where you take an Irby sprayer and hook it up to a peristaltic pump, et cetera. And then we use a Doppler GPS on the end of it to make sure we know we're moving at the right speed. And we were just in the process of testing these ULV rates on, on uh, Island Manzanita when we ran out of funding. So we don't really know that we've dialed that one in, but I do think it's possible. Phytophthora uh, phosphate doesn't work against everything. Um, this is a peninsula watershed where we had an experiment against Phytophthora remora, which, which is supposedly controllable by Phytophthora with trunk sprays. Uh, this is what the stand looked before we started treating it. Interesting, beautiful stand of tan oaks. Uh, this is what it looked like within a few years after Phytophthora came in. We had no suppression of disease at all by that application because it probably wasn't getting absorbed in adequate amounts. Okay, so just to end with, we, these Phytophthoras are not only a local problem, a statewide problem, they're global problem. Um, Western Australia uh, has tremendous issues with Phytophthora dieback. Um, here's one of their many slogans, um, and you know, keeping clean is the thing. Just recently, I was working on a technical advisory group for the cowrie dieback. We're still going on that, and that's in New Zealand, where Phytophthora is killing one of the iconic species there. Um, and we have Phytophthora threatening rare uh, species in, in California. We have them threatening uh, iconic habitats as well. So we really want to think about what we're doing out there. We want to use clean material. We want to avoid spreading Phytophthora. We need to understand these kinds of things. Um, so we keep, you know, keep try to keep our systems viable over the long term. We add all these phytophthoras to them and it is not really going to be a situation where you're going to be able to support things long term. So that is in a nutshell what I was going to talk to you today about. Hopefully some of that made some sense.